is two swords in conflict with each other. So peace has to be fought for in order to be maintained. Somebody just doesn't say, oh yeah, I want peace. Peace is like the Cold War. The Ameri America and Russia did not blow each other up because they could. So they each had the power to hurt the other and that became so scary that there was a stalemate, there was a peace. But peace is this tense thing. So when people say they want peace, um, peace is not a stagnant, simple, still state. It's this, it's like this. You have to fight for it. So um, it's like freedom. Um, so we have to fight for our freedoms in the United States. And, you know, there are a lot of people right now that would say we need to fight more for our freedoms, that freedoms are getting taken away. But that's that constant tension. Like we have this constant tension between the Senate and the Congress, and there's this constant tension about the bills and you know the judicial system, and that we've got those three systems that are creating checks and balances, and there's always this tension. So not one person has all the power. Not one thing has all the power, and they argue with each other a lot. Okay, and that's a constant state of tension, and yet it maintains the peace. When you're willing to engage the conflict um, in ways that are constructive, it will create peace. So um, you've got the symbol of the sun at the top, and at the bottom you've got the symbol of Libra. And so you've got the scales, which is Libra, in balance with uh, the moon. So there's the moon, and so the moon is about illusion, and so peace is sort of an illusion, but it's something that you have to constantly balance out, which is the scales. And then you go to the sorrow card, and the sorrow card, um, again, is about sadness and grief and loss. And Aleister Crowley um, did something amazing, which was that he made the Three of Swords the sorrow card because he believed grief and sadness is a mental state, it's a mental condition, it's not a physical, uh, emotional, con emotional condition. So I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but uh, this actually happened to me one time years ago, that I was waking up and I had this really great dream, and I actually noticed my mind, it's like, oh yeah, that was a really great dream, okay, wait a second, I'm waking up. Oh yeah, I was depressed. I actually noticed my mind remind myself that I was depressed, and I thought, I mean, how crazy is that? And so that's what I love about Aleister Crowley is he had some sort of awareness related to that, that it's a mental state that you're doing. It's a head trip you're running on yourself. It's an idea or an identity that you have decided and defined about yourself. I'm depressed. So I've seen people that, you know, they, they, would, they have this attitude that they were depressed at some point in their life and they still hold that in their body. And they're not really depressed anymore, but they have this body posture that's like, well, don't bother me because I'm depressed. Don't expect anything out of me because I'm depressed. And they use it like a shield, but it's almost like a defense posture. It's, it's something that their mind is doing to keep them from having to show up and be responsible. It's kind of interesting. So with this card, um, this card is supposed to represent um, funguses, and funguses grow on rocks and decaying things. So notice that there's a sense of decay. Um, and the flower is wilting and the leaves are falling apart. There's the sword of truth that was in the ace now being opposed by two other swords. And there's so much tension, there's so much mental tension that the two upper swords are bending. So again, think of like those two swords are putting so much pressure on the sword of truth that it's bending the swords. So that's a lot of tension. That's a lot of mental tension coming into play. And the flower is yellow, which means it's an emotional thing. There's some sort of emotional block, emotional issue, um, and this kind of a putridy, dark, mucky color. So there's, uh, it's like there's, whenever you're grieving or you're depressed, you, there's a kind of a rotten mental state that's not allowing you to move through it. And Grief should be a natural occurrence, and you should be able to move through grief, but some people will use grief as a weapon and keep themselves grieving over and over again, like allow that rotting to continue over and over again. So you've got the symbol of Saturn at the top and Libra at the bottom. So Saturn, the planet of hard work and struggle, is um, keeping the balance from happening. So you, you actually really have to work at it to stay in grief. I mean, because life, 
there's always ups and downs in life, and it's but you see people that they are so attached to the sadness or the grief that they keep recreating, and it's work to do that. It's like um, I remember at one point um, I said to somebody, I said, "When are you going to stop beating that dead horse?" That's this mm -hmm. card. It's sort of like you, you have to really work at it to stay depressed all the time. You have to constantly remind yourself, oh my gosh, yeah, you know, the sky is not blue and it's not a beautiful day out here. I'm really depressed because of whatever. And I'm going to focus only on that. I'm not going to focus on that there's this beautiful day happening. I mean, it's work to do that. To ignore the reality of a moment is really hard. Is it the same as like holding on to something that was um, unhappy in your life previously? Yeah. More, not just a death of someone, but something that happened and then making everything fall into that and be mm -hmm. part of that. Right. So I like to think of it as the neurological pathways in the brain. Mm -hmm. So literally something happened, some trauma happened to a person and they formed a neurological pathway of grief. And so now when anything gets close to that energy, uh -huh. any situation that's slightly similar, they'll pop down that neurological pathway in their brain mm -hmm. and go into that grief place. And is there a reluctance to let that go? Yeah. It just kind of like work hard to keep it there and not let all okay. get Yeah. So from there you go to the next card, which is the four. And the four is the truce card. And you've got Jupiter, the planet of expansion and abundance, in alignment with Libra. Um, so now we've finally got expansion and abundance in balance, thank goodness gracious. So if you're willing to let the grief go, you're willing to feel the grief, because you do have to feel grief to move through it sometimes. I mean, you can't deny grief if it's authentic grief. Um, but grief can also be a doorway into higher realms and a state of balance if you allow it to be, because all emotions are access portals to God and God consciousness. Um, so then you get to truce, and so now notice that there's a beautiful flower, there's a cross, a green cross of healing and transformation. You've got these swords that are completely in alignment with each other, um, and there's just a sense of harmony. There's a sense of balance, communication, alignment, understanding, agreement, that there's literally a truce, that something has come to a place of alignment within yourself, a place of balance within yourself. And then you go to the next card, and notice that we've got the five. Again, the five is feminine. Notice we've got the pentagram on its head again. <laughs> okay, so now the pet, the flower petals of the three, so those uh, flower petals of sorrow, have formed the star. So the petals have completely fallen apart. I like to think of this card as that song, Walking on Broken Glass. So it looks like shattered glass, broken glass. So the mind can make your experience like walking across broken glass all the time. The mind is this endless maze. It can remind you of all the little ouches and hurts in your life throughout all time. And then it can become this horrible obstacle course. So your mind can defeat you, undermine you, pull you down. Notice again that one of the swords has a chunk taken out of the sword. So it's actually a damaged sword and it's experiencing so much pressure that the other swords again are bending. So, you know, here's this sword that's trying to be truthful, but it's a wounded sword, and there's so much pressure from the mind infringing on it that that sword is at risk of collapsing. That sword has the potential to fall apart. So this is one of the few cards that I always say is a, uh, a defeat card from the standpoint of psychic attack. So people can get psychically attacked by other people. Now, oftentimes people are not conscious that they're doing this, but people having negative thoughts about you can throw little barbs energetically under the surface and you can feel really horrible and you don't even know it's happening. I'm sure you've all had that experience where you've been around somebody and you get that distinct feeling that they don't like you, but they're smiling and they're being nice, but there's this undercurrent that you think, am I doing something wrong? Do I smell? Is my hair wrong? I mean, there's this feeling like there's this undercutting and this is that kind of energy. So when this card comes in, I ask a person, are they undermining themselves with their own mind, which is possible? Are they allowing other people's perceptions of them to undermine their self-esteem? Um, but somehow the negative energy is sort of running amok and it's creating a, a sense of defeat and 
things falling apart and, and a loss. This card also represents petty, bitchy, backstabbing, cruel-minded, nasty little people, <laughs> okay? So where you're getting attacked. So you will see this card show up with people that are having conflicts at work and that there's some sort of backstabbing or problems going on behind the scenes. This card will definitely show up. And you've got the symbol of Venus at the top, which is the goddess of love. But at the bottom, you have the symbol of Aquarius. So you've got love trying to work through illusion, okay, and hopefulness in a way, but it's, it's, it's distorted. There's this kind of distorted energy here. And so Aquarians are visionary dreamers, and they want to make a difference and change the world and save humanity and all these beautiful things. But um, they want to love everybody, but sometimes people don't want to be loved. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, but sometimes people don't really want you. They don't think they're worth it. And so when you try to love them, they get mad at you. And, and you'll think, wow, I, I'm being really loving. Why are they gossiping behind my back? Why are they saying those nasty little things? And oftentimes it's because they don't feel worthy enough to be loved. And it's amazing how sometimes I've had the experience where somebody's in front of me and they go, I love you. And I'm like, oh, you don't know me. You don't love me. I mean, I, I can hear that dialogue. And this card is like that dialogue that runs in my head. And it's oftentimes only after a breakthrough that I can really feel, oh, they really do love me. But it's like I've created this illusion, like I'm walking across broken glass in some way in my mind that I'm not lovable. From there we go to the next card, which is the six, which is the science card. So again, in the career cards, this can be another career card. So this card can mean that somebody wants to be a scientist, uh, a researcher, a biologist, a professor of science, a science teacher, um, a mechanic, somebody, somebody that's dealing with sciences, uh, an astronomer, an astro uh, 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 somebody that's dealing with the stars. Um, but this is a science card, so it's somebody that was going to require a lot of scientific background and knowledge. Now, what's interesting about this card is that you've got the symbol of the cross in the center with science. Most people forget that religion was the first school. Okay, so you couldn't read or write unless you learned religion. And if you learned religion and wanted to be a priest, then you were allowed to learn to read and write. And then you were learn, uh, learned about the stars and foretelling things and fortune telling and soothsaying and all that kind of stuff that there was a connection but it was a science that was actually learned so um, the first schools were all related to religion and the Catholic religion specifically and the Catholic religion was actually the first religion that allowed women to have jobs so in ancient times they gave women the opportunity to be nuns and to get paid and to be able to be nurses so the first nurses were actually nuns and they were really officially trained and so um, the Catholic religion actually started the education of women because for many years only men were allowed to be educated. Um, so what you've got here is you've got all the swords in balance, you've got the symbol of Mercury at the top and Aquarius at the bottom so there's all this communication and hopeful expansive qualities with consciousness and clarity and trying to inspire and motivate the world. Notice there's interconnectedness with everything and there's a quest for information to find how everything is interconnected. And then you go to the seven and the seven is the futility card. And the futility card, um, notice that this color is kind of a, a light blue, a sky blue to reflect the sword energy. But we've got all these different swords and some of the swords have symbols on them like Jupiter, Mars, um, uh, Mercury, um, Venus, and then there's some odd little symbols on either side of those. But there's the Sword of Truth again being attacked by these opposing swords, these opposing opinions. Um, and it's trying to take little chunks, so see little scratches on the main sword? Um, you've got uh, the Moon at the top in opposition to Aquarius at the bottom. So now there's this illusion of what's true. What's true? I don't know what's true. Have you ever noticed that after you learn something, you realize how much you have to learn? <laughs> so, yeah, little knowledge is a dangerous thing, and so you suddenly realize, oh my gosh, how does everybody know all of this? It's so, it's, I'm so grateful that there are specialists these days that they spend their whole life learning 
ancient languages because then they can translate those documents but their whole life has to do that and it, it'll make you feel futile at a certain point when you're learning something you just think oh my gosh how could you possibly know all this information and it, it's a sense of hopelessness that pops in every once in a while